Good morning. Welcome to Equipping Hour. Make your way to a, uh, a spot to sit, and we'll get started this morning. Take your Bibles out, and uh, we're going to study the biblical concept or practice of contentment this morning. So I'm going to be content as you file in for Equipping Hour. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us. We thank you for the privilege of gathering together on a Sunday. Uh, one more reminder in our week that the tomb is empty, that you have conquered death, that you have secured justification for all who believe in you, uh, that you have secured a heavenly home for us, that you have taken care of every need we have. Lord, we praise you that in Christ we have everything, for we have you. We ask this morning that you would do work in our hearts in this area of contentment. May we be pleasing to you uh, as we hear and as we heed your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you ever wish things could be different? Do you ever look at your circumstances and groan a bit saying, I really want this to be different than it is? Think for a moment, just sort of make a mental catalog. What do you wish could be different? You might start thinking about a list. You might spend the next hour making a very long list. You might spend the next week adding to that list. If we, if we stop and think about all the things that are uncomfortable or wrong or unpleasant, things we'd like to change, uh, we could very easily make very long lists. The question for us this morning is, how do we respond to our circumstances when they are not what we desire? We are talking about contentment this morning, and I want to turn your attention as we start to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And Philippians chapter 4 is a chapter in your Bible which occurs in the letter to the Philippians, which is a letter that Paul wrote from prison. Just to stop and think about a circumstance for a moment, that's an undesirable circumstance that Paul could not change. And yet we parachute into this letter and we hear these words. Beginning in verse 11, Paul writes, Not that I speak from want, for I learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Don't miss that word learn. Paul learned. He says, I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in abundance. In any and all things, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This morning, we get to begin to learn the kind of contentment that the Apostle Paul had practiced, tapped into. Uh, the kind of thing that the Holy Spirit produced in a man like Paul. I will confess this morning to studying way beyond my obeying and teaching far beyond my ability to comply. Contentment is hard. And if you're anything like me, uh, these verses we will look at this morning, these topics may upend things in the soul. They may turn over soil in the heart that frankly needs to be turned over. And we'll have the opportunity this morning, I believe, to grow in contentment. I want to put up on the screen for you a couple of recommended resources at the front end. You can take a picture of these. You can write these down. Uh, the Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment by Jeremiah Burroughs uh, is a fantastic read. That's, that's on the list of a book every Christian must read. Uh, just put that in your list. Someday get around to that. Um, you can find that in our bookstore. If it's not in the bookstore, ask the fine friends in the bookstore, how do I get this book? Titles, good titles are hard to come by. This is one of those really good titles, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. We'll talk this morning about the difference between a sort of natural contentment and a grace-generated contentment that only a Christian can have. That's the kind of contentment we're after. That's the kind of contentment that Jeremiah Burroughs puts forth. And it is a contentment that is rare, perhaps rare even amongst Christians, but it is a jewel. 
that is a precious commodity. And so the, the title alone is this haunting, intimidating, convicting title. And so you need to have it on your shelf just so the spine stares at you and convicts you. But then you also need to read it and apply it. Uh, the second resource I have on there is The Greener Grass Conspiracy by Stephen Altrog. Uh, that, again, is just, if you think about best titles of books ever, that, that has to be on the list. Uh, there is a conspiracy run by the Greener Grass Committee. You understand the, the imagery. The grass is greener on the other side. It actually seldom is. But there is something about grass over there that tugs at our hearts. And the issue is not how green is the grass, how high is the fence, can I find something around the corner that will actually satisfy you already know your heart well enough to know the best job still stinks, or the next job you're going to get stinks like the one you had. It's cursed by God. If you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you know that every experiment Solomon attempted brought the same vanity of vanities. An emptiness, a chasing after the wind. There's something around the corner that's better than what I have now. I've got to go get it. And so there is this conspiracy the, uh, of the greener grass that tugs at the human heart. What is it tugging on? Frankly, it's tugging on your theology. When you feel that tug, you are feeling the tug of theology applied. And discontentment and or contentment reveals what you truly believe about God, about yourself, about your circumstances. So I recommend those two resources to you. The titles alone can sit on your shelf and bring conviction, um, but do read them. Let me give you a definition of godly contentment from Jeremiah Burroughs' book. I have this for, for you up on the screen. He writes, Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise, fatherly disposal in every condition. And you know that Jeremiah Burroughs is a Puritan, and so every word in this Puritan definition becomes an exposition. These are heavy, weighted words, and so you need to read the book to unpack every word he uses in that definition. I've flipped the definition and have this for you up on the screen as an attempt at a definition of discontentment. Sinful discontentment, if we just reverse Burroughs' definition, is a bitter, inward, grumbling, natural frame of spirit which resists and resents God's wise fatherly disposal in a given circumstance. Discontentment is this bitter, inward, grumbling, natural frame of spirit that resists and resents God's wise, fatherly disposal in a given circumstance. Frankly, discontentment is not embracing with gratitude God's good ordering of my situation. It stems from redefining desires as needs. It's rooted in the pride of entitlement and self-focus. And it is grounded in residual unbelief. That is a failure to believe that God is sovereign and that God is good. And the fruit of that failure, the fruit of the failure of contentment, is a discordant symphony of grumbling and complaining. A grumbling and complaining that clouds our judgment and ruins our witness. We'll come later this morning to the, the reality of a, of a heart that is content in the grace of God's provision in your circumstance is a fantastic testimony in a world that can't touch contentment. A world that only knows the language of complaint and grumbling. A Christian who does not do that stands out. You actually proclaim the goodness of God and the goodness of His plan. Discontentment in the heart breeds a whole cacophony of sins like anger, bitterness, complaining, comparisons, 
jealousy, fear, the fear that I'm not going to get what I believe will satisfy my needs, my so-called needs, resentment, resentment about my circumstances, resentment towards God himself, self-pity, the discontentment can lead to compromise. What holiness will you shortcut in order to satisfy your discontentment? Discontentment results in escaping, uh, an escapist mentality. I, I've just got to get out of this situation. Maybe there's some other God, some other altar I can bow down to, some other power I can serve that will give me what I need to be content. This discontentment can cause us to neglect responsibility, to not do what we should do when we should do it, uh, which is really one of the practical definitions of depression. If you were to trace depression back to its roots, there are a number of causes, but a significant cause of depression in the heart and in the life is this whole attitude of discontentment. So we need to get to to the bottom of this. There is a natural form of contentment. There's a kind of contentment that the, that the world can get a hold of and practice. It is not a gospel grace contentment. Uh, but you can be, I don't really care if anything changes. You can be that way simply because you are senseless, dull, stupid, and uncaring. <laughs> ah, come see, come saw, come what may, say la vie. It is what it is. These are sort of the world's coping mantras of just, I don't really care. That's not biblical contentment. There is the kind of natural contentment that comes with having your circumstances match your expectations. You know, a great definition of disappointment is the gap between expectations and reality. I expect this to happen, this happened instead, the space in between is all my disappointments, all my discontentments. So, if I can get my reality up to my expectations, discontentment is solved. Right? That is a a natural solution and it doesn't actually address the heart problem. This is the idea of bringing your possessions up to your desires. That is a contentment by getting what I want. It is at its bottom self-love. That doesn't make you a content person. The reality is there will be other things to want. There will be other expectations and then a gap and more disappointment. You who have raised toddlers have seen the toddler tantrum. Um, Perhaps only one. (laughs) Maybe you live in a toddler tantrum environment, you understand that if you appease the toddler tantrum, the tantrums grow with the toddler. They get bigger as time goes by. They, they may become more sophisticated. They may be less embarrassing than feet out, fists out, pounding the carpet. But they are tantrums nonetheless. And, and they are the behavioral expressions of sinful discontentment. But if I am content because I receive with gratitude whatever God's good providence renders, that contentment is sourced in the love of God, God's love for me and my love for Him. And it is not subject to changing circumstance. That kind of contentment has as its source new birth. And it has as its energy the gracious work of the Holy Spirit in the believer. He works in us so that we work according to his power to subdue sinful discontentment and to embrace with gratitude God's provision. So this morning, and we'll see how far we get perhaps next week, we're going to trace through some fighter theology, some imperatives that we need to subdue discontentment and to embrace Godly biblical contentment. Let me give you some caveats up front. I'll give you four caveats. They're up on the screen for you. Number one, godly contentment is not opposed to prayer. When we talk about biblical contentment, we don't mean your circumstance must always stay the same. We're not actually talking about your circumstances at all. We're talking about your heart's disposition toward the circumstances God has you in. 
Can God take you out of your circumstance? Yes. Does God enlist his children to pray? Yes, often to be relieved of difficult circumstances, to get out of them. And, and you know, our, our heart attitude must not be first and foremost, how do I get out of a difficult circumstance? But rather, how do I get out of this circumstance? How do I get from this circumstance the things God intends for me in it? Right? That is the difference between I want what I want, self-love, and I trust my good God. But biblical contentment is not opposed to prayer. You're in a difficult circumstance? Pray for relief. Our God is good and he loves his children. And he uses means to accomplish his purposes. You can pray. And you can pray from a heart of contentment that your circumstance will be changed. That's okay. Second caveat, godly contentment is not opposed to sorrow. You can feel sorrow in a sorrowful situation. You can have godly sorrow. You can have godly sorrow over a circumstance that's difficult, a consequence that's hard, the effects of sin in your own life, the effects of sin on someone else, the general effects of the curse and the fall on all of humanity around us. There is an appropriateness to our sorrow. We are actually commanded to weep with those who weep, and we can do so from a heart of contentment in God's providential care. Those things are not opposed. Third caveat, godly contentment is not opposed to legitimate means of improvement of circumstance. If you don't like your job, you're allowed to get another job. We don't live in the feudal era of medieval Europe where you must do what your dad did by apprenticeship and that's all you will ever do, class system, fixed rigidity. We don't live then. You can get another job. But you shouldn't get another job with the hopes of satisfying inward, ungodly, sinful discontentment. Did you know the new job doesn't have the power to fix that? You can change your circumstance. God's not opposed to that. Contentment's not opposed to that. If they are legitimate means of, of changing or improving your situation, that's okay. And then fourth caveat, there is a kind of holy discontentment. We shouldn't just be okay with everything. A holy discontentment, particularly in the realm of my own sanctification, is appropriate. I ought not be fat, dumb, and happy in where I am in the Christian life. If you coast, you're toast. Be discontent with, with your godliness. Be discontent with your conformity to Christ's likeness. Christian, grow. Grow up. Put things to death. Flee things. Make no provision for other things. Love Christ more. Long for heaven more. Hate sin more. There's a holy discontentment in the Christian growth process. There's also a holy discontentment over the broken, futile, cursed state of the world in which we live. Listen, all creation groans sinlessly. Romans 8, all creation is personified. Think rocks granite, and broccoli. They cannot wait until the sons of God are conformed to the image of Christ in all of our glory. Why? Romans 8 says, because then the creation will be set free from its slavery to corruption. There is a groaning in the created world over the state of things. Sin and rebellion against God is not right. The curse of God on the universe because of those things is just and right, but not permanent. And so the groaning we experience is a reminder that this isn't home. There's a holy discontentment with that. This isn't where we belong. This is not how things will be ultimately. So godly contentment, what we're aiming at is not an attitude like the world says of it's fine, I'm fine, everything's fine. Sort of a, a whitewashing over difficulty. That is not biblical and godly contentment. It's not as um, the, the, the fine modern poets of the band Pink Floyd said, hanging on in quiet desperation. That's not the goal. It's sort of a grit your teeth and go along with what life gives you. That's not godly contentment. There is a way to recognize that things could and should be different, there's even an appropriateness to our desiring some things to be different. 
But godly contentment implicitly means we trust our good God and his infinitely wise providence to do what is best for us and for his glory. Again, we go back to Burroughs' definition. Contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise, fatherly disposal in every condition. Rather than bringing our possessions up to our desires, grace contentment is bringing our desires down to our circumstances. In other words, what God has for me in this, I'll be content with that. Not I solve my discontentment by raising my circumstance. I solve discontentment by trusting my good God. Maybe you've heard people say, in response to a difficult situation, well, this is what God has for me. And maybe you've written that off as a platitude. I don't like the word platitude. Do you know what what a platitude is? A platitude is a short form of a theological truth that we resent. (laughs) Somebody speaks a truth to me. I don't like that you said that to me right now. Don't give me platitudes. What else are we supposed to hold on to? (laughs) But shortcuts to theological truth when we need them. Now, I'm not advocating don't care for somebody, just write them off, send them a verse, and, and don't care, be on your way. But I do mean that we ought to have theological truth in our hearts and on our lips so that in difficult circumstances, that's what comes out. Friends, it's what I need you to say to me. Sure, I'd love for you to care for me and sit with me in the ashes. And I need truth. We need these truths. We need these truths related to contentment, and we need them together. So let's start down a path of an 18-point outline that we might call fighter theology, imperatives that you and I need to fight for grace contentment. Um, So get your Bibles out. Uh, We'll be looking at a number of passages And I've just sort of tried to organize these thoughts into some commands, some imperatives to help us fight for contentment. Imperative number one, acquire a right view of self and desserts. Acquire a right view of self and desserts. Now, why is Smed talking about dessert at a quipping hour? That's not till after breakfast and after lunch and after dinner and then second dessert at bedtime. Uh, My mouth is watering already. Isn't that an interesting word, desserts? Have you ever thought about it? What do you get after you finish your meal? I get what I deserve. Pineapple and coconut ice cream. Or whatever you think you deserve. (laughs) I've earned this. It's what I'm worth. That's just an interesting way to talk about sweets after dinner. What I mean by desserts here is the impression of what it is that I deserve. And we need to get this right. We need to have a right and biblical view of who I am, of what I've done, of what I deserve, and what I get instead. The passages will be up on the screen. You can turn to them uh, or you can listen in. First, let's look at Lamentations 3. Lamentations 3, beginning in verse 37. Who is there who speaks and it happens unless the Lord has commanded it? So this is a beginning statement of God's sovereignty. And in Lamentations 3, remember we're sitting with Jeremiah on the hill overlooking Jerusalem while the city is being besieged. People are in a, a destitute and famine condition. And Jeremiah is saying, God's in charge. God brought the siege. God brought the enemies of Israel to her doorstep to lay siege to the city. This is judgment and God's in control. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good go forth? You can't say God's sovereign over, only over the good things. God's sovereign over all things. And verse 39... Why should any living person or any man complain because of his sins? Now, just an an interpretive detail here. This is a rhetorical question. 
Uh, my Bible has a little bit of white space there. That's not designed for me to fill in the answer to the question with all the reasons I think I'm justified in complaining against the Lord. The rhetorical question has as its implicit answer, if you think about your sin at all, there's no room for complaint against the Lord. When you think about who you are and what you deserve before a holy God and what you have received instead in His mercy, there's not a room for complaint. We will take some time in a future equipping hour and just unfold the, the practice of complaining from the Bible. Contentment's sort of the positive side. Complaining, grumbling is the negative side. But just know that there's no room for complaint if we have a right view of ourselves and a right view of what we deserve. Second bit of theology here, an imperative for us, is to maintain a big view of mercy and grace. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. We need to maintain a big view of mercy and grace. And mercy is God's pity, uh, pitying withholding of what we deserve. Grace is God's undeserved favoring, giving us what we don't deserve. And both of those are on display in the gospel. Ephesians 2 verse 3 describes who we are and what we did. We all formerly conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were naturally children of wrath, even as the rest but God, verse 4, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If we start with our sin and we move to God's mercy and the saving grace in the gospel, which seats us in heaven with Christ, that ought to be the cure to all discontentment. That ought to be enough theology for us. And you say, why do we need 16 more points? I think God knows what we need on areas like this. If, if you ever take any sin area and just sort of uh, see everything the Bible has to say about it. You see that there are a number of different angles, a number of different sides, like the prismatic effects of a diamond cut with many sides, and you get to see different layers of light come in. I think God knows we need different angles on this. So for now, there are 16 more points in the outline. Number three, here's a third bit of fighting theology, an imperative for us. Get a faith grip on attributes. And I just point out four. Goodness, sovereignty, providence, and freedom. The goodness of God, the sovereignty of God, the providence of God, and the freedom of God. And you need to know that afflictions test your theology. They reveal our theology. Contentment and discontentment reveal what we truly believe about God. Let's look at Psalm 119. And verse 68. We need to get a right view of the goodness of God. The psalmist affirms, Psalm 119, 68, you are good, God's ontological goodness manifests in his behavioral goodness. You are good and you do good. God could not do otherwise. He is fundamentally, unequivocally, totally, and infinitely good. And therefore, he can do nothing other than what flows out of his nature. He is good and he does good. There have been times of trial in our family where this was a mantra for us. God, you are good and you do good. Why? Because we're tempted to think that God's not good we're tempted to think that what he's doing in our lives is not good. And frankly, these are assaults on his very being. It is a failure of belief at the attributes of God level. And so we need to rehearse these things for our heart. I would commend to you memorizing this verse. You are good and you do good. Teach me your statutes. You are good and you do good. Teach me your statutes. 
You are good and you do good. Teach me your statutes. Did you memorize it yet? It's a good one to hold on to. Second, secondly, God's sovereignty. We, we need to rehearse this for ourselves. It's one thing for God to be good and, and to try real hard to be good. But you know, there's a lot of forces in the world and, and a lot of powerful forces. And, and is, is God really stronger than all of those things? Is his good intention uh, coupled with power to enact those good intentions? And the answer to that, if you've read your Bible, is yes, absolutely. And many places we could turn here, but Psalm 135, 5 and 6, I know that Yahweh is great and that our Lord is greater than all gods. Whatever Yahweh pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in seas and in all depths. This is the sovereignty of God. This is God's being his, the sum total of his attributes and his purpose enacted in the world. We believe in God's meticulous sovereignty. R.C. Sproul said it well, there's not a rogue molecule in the universe. There's not a single thing outside of God's control. There is no thing stronger than God. Coupled with God's perfect knowledge and wisdom, coupled with God's infinite goodness, and coupled with God's special love for his children, the sovereignty of God is a comfort. Now, if God were not good and he didn't love us, that would be no comfort at all. Sure, he's in control of everything. But he's in control and he's good and he loves his children. That's a comfort for us. Ought to breed contentment. And we need a faith grip on providence. On providence. This is related to the goodness and the sovereignty of God. We see this in James chapter 1. There, James affirms that God is the giver of good gifts. Every good and perfect gift comes down from Him, our Father. And there is no shifting shadow in Him. There is not a shade of change in His being, His purpose, His attributes, His love, His care. He is rock solid, reliable. He's good. He, he provides. His providence is his providence for the world. And we need to get a faith grip on God's freedom. His freedom. Again, if, if God were free, that is sovereign, if he were king and, and no one could thwart his plans... But he weren't good and he didn't love us and he didn't have good purposes for us, we'd be in a lot of trouble. If he were capricious and powerful, that would be a frightening universe. But at bottom, God as maker and as king of the universe is not to be trifled with. Listen to the words of Romans 9, 19. Who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? Will the thing made say to the maker, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have authority over the clay to do as he pleases? Now that is a context of soteriology. God answering the question, I want to have mercy on this person and not mercy on that person. And God's free to do what he wants. And who's going to answer back to God? But the principle there applies to all things. Would you show up in God's courtroom in front of all the angelic beings, in front of all of the redeemed saints who are already home and assault God's character and his purposes in the throne room of heaven? Make your protest. The reality is discontentment in my heart is that very protest. It's an assault on God's goodness, sovereignty, providence, and his freedom to do as he sees fit. Number four, here's another imperative to help us fight for godly contentment. We need to biblically define needs versus desires. Now, we talk about what we need, and what we mean often is, I want, I desire. And we need to reframe this. We, we need to reframe this according to the Bible. 
And, and I don't want to dislodge our vocabulary so it's totally impossible to, to think and communicate, right? If, if I'm putting on a roof and I say, I need to go to Lowe's and get some nails, and you say to me, no, what you need is your sins forgiven. You need nothing else whatsoever. Okay, then language just fell apart and we can't talk to each other anymore. Don't take this to the wrong extreme, okay? We can use the word need in a penultimate way, not an ultimate way, to describe things we're trying to accomplish. But when we talk about ultimate needs, we need to be very careful. We so often place our desires, our preferences, at the level of need, like Maslow's, Laszlo's? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Do you remember the triangle? Um, you, you have certain things that, that you need. Oxygen's at the top of the list, right? Because you can't go very long without oxygen. Uh, next is water, because you can go a little longer without water than oxygen, but not much. And, and then food's next, because you can go longer without food than without water. And then shelter and clothing and, and relational continuity and all the whatever else is on the list. But if you had all of those things and you didn't have your sins forgiven and you met your maker, that's it. And you realize you had the triangle wrong. <laughs> Who cares what Maslow says? I needed to be right with God. If I never had another heartbeat, I need to be right with him. That is your ultimate need. And Christian, if you are in Christ, you don't need another nail from Lowe's. You don't need a roof, ultimately speaking. You don't need a a reputation in a fallen world. You don't need to be understood. You don't need comfort. You don't need material prosperity. You don't need the health and vigor and vitality of your maximum self at 19 years old. We just have to reframe what we think our needs are. And we can slot them in the realm of desires. And and we can plead with God for a change of circumstance. But we do have to make sure we're understanding the difference between what we need as defined by God versus what we desire. And we don't slot them in the wrong place. Let's just listen to God's word in a few spots here. These may seem unrelated at first. I hope you catch the connection. Turn to 2 Timothy 3. Verse 15, Paul is writing to Timothy and he describes to him first the Old Testament and then I believe in verse 16, he is describing both the Old Testament and the New Testament as Paul is receiving from God as apostle New Testament revelation alongside the Old Testament and he calls the whole package of God's word all scripture. Listen to verse 15, from childhood, Timothy, you've known the sacred writings which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be equipped, having been thoroughly equipped for every good word, being adequate to every task. In other words, having all that you need. You heard Jesus say something similar when he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. There is an adequacy, a sufficiency to the word of God that meets what God calls a need. A need. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 3, his divine power has granted, has already granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Through what vehicle? Through the full knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. There is a need for the Christian life. A need of life and godliness in that life that God has already given. 
I don't have what I need. We've just seen two significant areas where God says, you have what you need in what I've already given. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We see this in the heart of Paul. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. God is able to make every grace abound to you, so that in everything, at every time, having every sufficiency, you may have an abundance for every good deed. God is committed to giving you everything that you need, particularly here in the realm of of good deeds. You remember John 15, 5? This is another way to get at the same issue. Jesus said, abide in me, for apart from me, you can do nothing. What is your greatest need? To abide in Christ, to be close to him, to be vitally connected to him uh, by the means that Christ has provided. Indwelling Holy Spirit, the written word, God's people, abide in Him, live in Him, dwell in Him. He is the supplier of all your needs. And then you know the scene in in Luke. Um, No, we're not going to get to Luke yet. Uh, Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Verses 7 and 8. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. This is Paul sort of recounting his own testimony, but specifically through the frame of all the things I thought I needed, all the things that I achieved, all the things that made up my identity and my pedigree, all the things that lent themselves to my own self-promotion, everything I thought I wanted. And he says, whatever things were gained to me, verse 7, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost because because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. This gets down to the bottom need of of humanity. You need Christ. You need Him such that everything else is rubbish and the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glorious face. Wonderful face. We sing these songs, take the world and give me Jesus. And our public professions of contentment in Christ get tested in affliction. And they get revealed in our discontentments. They get revealed in our complaining and our grumbling. You know, John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. And then it was difficult for John the Baptist when he was in jail. That's sort of a decrease. (laughs) A decrease in usefulness, a decrease in proximity to people who needed a message that he was put on the earth to proclaim. And it went away. And then, of course, John the Baptist decreased right about the neck. I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. I want Jesus to be everything. Lord, take everything from me if I can only have you. And then these things get tested. Listen, the Lord is kind. He doesn't put us beyond what he knows we're able to bear. And he gives us a way of escape and strength to endure. I'm not convinced my level of godly spiritual contentment could withstand a Job scenario. I am confident that my God is good and he would be near to the brokenhearted. That whatever he has for me, he would be enough. I'm not sure I want to test drive all the possibilities. Number five. We need to learn to reject comparisons. We need to learn to reject comparisons. If we are to have godly contentment, we need to stop looking around. This is the greener grass conspiracy. Look what so-and-so has, right? Psalm 73, Psalm 37, don't envy the wicked. Why? 
Now oh, they sprout up now. Things go great. They're easy. Oh, life is fat for them. It's great. They party all the time. And I'm over here groveling in my obedience to the Lord. They're partying it up. Don't envy them. Why? Fast forward the tape. Their end is destruction. Fast forward your own tape. Everything in Christ. You're an inheritor of infinite riches. And heaven is home. Your citizenship is there. Philippians 3.20. Don't envy them now. We make the comparisons. And you have to know they're artificial. They are artificial. When you look at someone else's life. And you think. Oh man. Um, they're not in financial debt. Uh, they don't have car troubles. Uh, they don't have these difficulties. They have a place to live. Whatever it is you're looking at and, and you see them, you, you don't see the totality of someone else's life. Through the eyes of envy, you only see what you desire that they have. You don't see the troubles that come with what they have. You don't see the difficulties that come with their apparent prosperity their apparent ease of life. You don't see the snares and the dangers. You don't see the corruptions uh, that, that prevail in the heart. You don't see the cost it is to keep and maintain all of those shiny things that they have. The comparisons are dangerous for us at the heart level. And if you're going to do battle with discontentment in the heart, you have to do away with the comparisons. And listen, social media is a great big trap for the comparison that promotes envy and jealousy. And, and you have to learn to put those in their place. Um, someone has something. Can I rejoice with those who rejoice? Or do I have an envious eye with discontentment grumbling against the Lord over it? And you have to actually corral your heart as you scroll. And maybe make no provision for the flesh and don't scroll. Whatever it is you need to do, you have to put away the comparisons. And we can compare ourselves to anybody's enviable situation. Man, they don't have all this stuff they have to worry about. Their life is so simple. You watch the world do this pendulum thing. I want all this stuff. No, simplicity is the way to go. Big house, tiny house. They don't know how to solve this thing. They can't solve contentment without the gospel, without the power of the Holy Spirit. And in the Christian life, we will not put discontentment to death while we put in front of our eyes the things that provoke comparisons. We have to put them away. James 3.16 says this, where jealousy exists, there is disorder and every evil thing. Do you have a jealous eye on someone else's situation? <laughs> what is the result of that? Disorder and lots of other evil. Number six, this one's related. Distrust your ability to handle comfort, ease, prosperity, health, things going your way, getting what you want, making your expectations and your reality merge. Friend, will it go well for you if it does? Will your heart be in better shape if you got everything you wanted right now? I'm not convinced we're good at that. Everybody goes after fame. Not everybody. Some people, I don't want that. I don't want to be famous. The world goes after fame, fortune, celebrity. We value it. We look at people and go, wow. Wouldn't that be great to, I don't think it would. Do you know famous, happy people? That's a rarity. There aren't many people who can handle a stage, a microphone, a book deal, a contract, sports celebrity. That's a very tough road. Why? Because it, it plagues the human heart with traps and trials that the hoi polloi don't have to deal with. Put that on a smaller scale and just think, would I, would I do well if I was comfortable? Would I do well if I were at ease? Would I do well if I were prosperous and, and had no health problems? If there were no discomforts in my life, would I be better off spiritually? 
You think back in your own life to, to seasons where God was, was generous in giving you a season of ease and comfort and prosperity. And I want you to turn to Proverbs chapter 30. I think the writer of this proverb experienced what Paul described. I have learned, Paul said, to have a lot and have a little. What do you mean you learned the secret of abundance? There's a secret to godly contentment in abundance. The kind of contentment that says, ooh, I don't want to trust these things. God, I need to trust you. These things are nice, but don't let my heart go astray. Have you learned that secret? Listen to how the writer of Proverbs prays against his own prosperity. Verse 8, keep worthlessness and every false word far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with my daily bread. Give me the food that's my portion. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who's Yahweh? Or lest I be impoverished and steal and profane the name of my God. That's a great prayer. It's an honest prayer. It's an honest prayer that the the proverb writer says, I wouldn't be good with the temptation of theft if I were hungry. God, can I just have my daily bread? I know what my heart would do if I had a lot of bread. I'd forget God. So give us this day our daily bread. That's a good prayer. It's it's an honest prayer that recognizes the dangers of the human heart. Number seven, beware underlying idolatries. Beware underlying idolatries. What are the altars of worship, alternate gods, false deities, idols of the heart, the things we love more than we love God, that are underneath discontentment? At bottom, you know, all idolatry, whether it's a bowing down to sticks and stones or, or whether it's the intangible idolatries of worshiping uh, sex, money, pleasure, uh, reputation, prominence, whatever it is, whatever those things are, we're tempted to sacrifice for, to, to love more than we love God, the things we're willing to compromise on in order to get. They're all in the realm of idolatry. And at the bottom of all idolatry, frankly, is the worship of self. You know, you, you may have think that all the ites in the land of promise, the, the, the Jebusites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and all the other ites as they worshiped the Baals, Molech and Chemosh and Asherah, you, you, you may have think that they, they just loved those deities because those deities are so special, so good, so wonderful. I will give up all to gain Chemosh because he's wonderful. Uh, not at all. It was a genie in a lamp theology. It was, I'll rub the lamp three times and Chemosh will give me what I want. Idolatry at its base is the worship of self. What sacrifices do I have to do? What rituals do I have to participate in? Do I have to give my firstborn over to the fires of Molech in order to have good crops? Why? I want good crops. I want material prosperity. And I'll murder to get it. If that's what the ritual demands. And you see the parallel to the sort of intangible idolatries in our own day. If, if my idol is career advancement, what will I compromise to get it? Take shortcuts that dishonor God? Um, tell lies like everybody else does? Uh, cheat? Unethical, immoral decisions? If my idol is, I want to be in a relationship, what compromises am I willing to make to get it? To get what I think I want. This is where we elevate anything to the level of, I love it more than I love God because I'm willing to sin to get it. Or I'm willing to sin in my heart by complaint when I don't get what I want. That's sort of the heart test drive for an idolatry. And I have up on the screen for you, 1 Samuel 12, 20 to 22, And there, this is the scene where the people have asked for a king, and they've asked for a king sinfully, and God has commissioned Samuel the prophet to actually install a king for the people. 
And they wanted a king because we want to be cool like all the other countries. We reject Yahweh as our king. We can't see him. Uh, we, we, we don't know he's going to fight for all battles because he doesn't have a, a, a horse and a spear. And he isn't standing on the ground. We want the security that comes with having an office holder. Well, it's a bad deal. Yahweh would have fought all their battles and won. <laughs> and, and so now they're going to have kings with consequences. And God answers their request, and, and Samuel obeys God, and in the unfolding of God's plan from this kingly line is going to come the Messiah king, son of David eventually, who will rule the earth and will do good. Uh, that is the king we long for. Yahweh will be king over his people on the earth, and so God's going to answer his own purpose through his people's sinful request. And Samuel gives in this scene this really fantastic warning at the heart level Okay, God's meeting your request. God's going to do what you asked. And yes, you asked it sinfully, but ask God, he'll forgive and watch your heart. Here's, here's Samuel's word, Samuel 12, 20 to 22. He says, you have committed this evil. Yet do not turn aside from following Yahweh. Serve Yahweh with all your heart. And you must not turn aside, for then you would go after meaningless things. And the word meaningless there is the, the same word for vanity used in Ecclesiastes and the same word for idols used in the prophets. You will go after emptinesses which cannot profit and cannot deliver because they are emptinesses. Followed by this great promise in verse 22. Yahweh will not abandon his people on account of his own great name. Listen, Yahweh's commitment to his own glory means a fidelity to keep his promises. And so trust him and you'll be great. Be content in him, you'll be fine. A, be, a, 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 a seed of bitterness, a seed of discontentment will entice you to go after other things than Yahweh. And guess what will happen? Nothing. The things you think you're going to get will be like a vapor. It will be like chasing after the wind. Meaninglessness, emptiness, nothing. And we'll conclude here this morning. But you need to know discontentment outwardly reveals an emptiness inwardly. It's an emptiness that we might call a Yahweh vacuum. If Yahweh is not filling up your heart and you be happy in Him... You were built for happiness, you'll seek it in other things, lesser things, disappointing things, grievous things, idolatrous things, sinful things. How do you get contentment? Bottom line, God's good and he does good. Trust him. Trust him in every circumstance and say, not as a platitude, not as a throwaway, but as real theology, this is what God has for me. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word, which peels layers off of our corruptions. And we go deeper and we see more. I just recognize, Lord, that discontentment is a deep-seated reality in the human heart, and it is so easily a reality in my own heart. I pray that we would live as we aspire, that we might trust you even as we sing. Uh, take all the world, let me have Jesus. Uh, let everything be counted as rubbish if I may only have Christ. Uh, surely, Lord, you are enough. We, we believe this, help our unbelief. We, we love you. We've tasted and seen that you are good. And we pray that we might be fully satisfied in you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.